oftentimes when we think of supplements, we immediately jump to high sport performance type of things or vigorous workouts or, or muscle building. Though that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, take, for example, creatine. And I've spoken about this at length and with Darren, Darren Kandow, who's done a tremendous amount of research. I was just up at his lab recently in Canada. And he has covered extensively. In fact, I, I think I put up a post, perhaps I could draw this up, um, where he laid out all the myriad of benefits of creatine. This is taken in the, you know, typically three to five grams per day of dose of creatine monohydrate, which has the most research behind it. Um, seems to be extremely low side effects in almost anyone. And the benefits include, of course, things like uh, muscle performance and strength and things like that. And if you go back to our discussion in our episode on metabolism and, and endurance, uh, we talked about the phosphocreatine system. So you can figure out kind of what this is going to do in terms of effect. That said, there's excellent information and data coming out now on, on the benefits of bone mineral density in creatine. Uh, there's a ton of work looking at a host of cognitive factors um, from memory, executive function, uh, to effects potentially on even things like depression, uh, mood, to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, all forms of, of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious the brain loves creatine as a fuel. And so not only, we sort of discussed it in the episode as being the fuel for skeletal muscle contraction, but the brain needs to do that as well. The astrocytes around the brain need to be able to provide energy, et cetera. So it's very clear that metabolism in the brain is reduced with things like TBI and potentially concussions. So um, now to be extremely clear, creatine does not prevent any of those diseases. It does not treat any of them and the data are mixed, but it's more and more are coming. Uh, some show a little bit of benefit, some show you know, maybe none, but I'm not aware of any research in those areas that show it has any downside. Uh, for the most part, side effects are extremely minimal, if not null, and then potentially some benefit, in, depending on the specific study. So we could put up, a, uh, if you'd like, a couple of links directly to those meta-analyses, and, and we'll folks that. can go through those things one by one. So um, I only say that to, again, maybe expand our understanding or thinking about what these types of supplements can do. It's not just about growing muscle, or, um, you know, high performance. It's everything to, again, there's an association with recovery. Uh, so creatine is fantastic for recovery from muscle, for muscle damage, uh, helps and, and can potentially aid in fat loss uh, and a whole host of things. So you can actually also even look at websites like examine.com. I have you know, no affiliation with them whatsoever, but if you want to just type in something like creatine monohydrate, uh, you can see a whole list and, and you're going to see thousands of studies of the potential benefits uh, of creatine. So that is is always number one on my list. I'm relieved to hear that creatine sits at the top of your supplementation list because, uh, well, first of all, I started taking it when I was in college. At that time, I was taking it in this kind of loading mode where you take it in, um, you know, anywhere from uh, 15 to 25 grams per day, often causing some gastric distress, often combining it with fruit juice to try and shuttle it into the muscles. Sure. And then a so-called maintenance phase of reducing to 10 or 15 grams per day. Um, nowadays, I just take about five grams or so, although later I know you're going to tell me why I should probably be taking more than five grams per day, given my body weight. So I know we'll get into some of those specifics a little bit later. But in addition to experiencing direct effects on uh, muscle size and strength, which I did, I don't know how it contributed to my cognitive function or if it does now, because there's really no way to tease that out with, with standard um, uh, at-home tests, like a scale. <laughs> uh, but it is very clear to me based on the literature uh, that you described and um, some of which we've covered on other episodes of the podcast that the phosphocreatine system is vitally important for forebrain function, right? The forebrain, of course, being the uh, the uh, portion of brain, uh, broadly speaking, the portion of brain just behind your forehead that is uh, responsible for planning, action, setting rules and context. So um, even as simple as if you're going downfield in a game of soccer or basketball and you're on offense and then uh, you make an attempt on goal or basket and then it switches and you go back, now you're on defense. That it's, Being on defense is very different than being on offense. And that goal, excuse me, that, that rule switching is a prefrontal cortical function as is every context dependent way of thinking or, or acting. And so anything that can favor function of the forebrain, I think is good for uh, humans in general. It suppresses anxiety, allows us to interpret what's going on for us. And so I'm very um, relieved and gratified to hear that creatine sits at the top of the list. Also, as I'm sure you'll point out again later, creatine 
is for the most part a relatively affordable supplement yeah. for most people. So here we're not talking about something that's really esoteric or that you have to you know fly to um, some remote location to get an infusion of. <laughs> right. Um, but that although has, I apologize to all you because I know the price has skyrocketed recently. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Uh, I think it's a well nobody knows, but it's quote unquote a supply and and. Uh, demand issue, if you will. So uh, those prices have gone up. There's also, of course, been shipping problems in the world and things. So uh, every time I, I talk about creatine right now, people just flame me mm. for like, oh my God, it's so expensive now. I'm like, I know, I'm sorry, but honestly, it's only so expensive because you're used to being so cheap. So when you when you counter the fact that you're like, <laughs> right. yeah, like relative to the other stuff you're probably taking, relative to any other number of purchases, um, for the, it still lands very high in my ROI list, my, you know, my 80, 20, because of that it, it's, um, it can be taken any time of the day. It doesn't have to be in magical combination. You talked about co-ingesting with carbohydrates that can enhance, uh, how quickly you can get into the system. In fact, it's, it's going to work on the exact same as mechanisms we'll probably or potentially talk about in hydration. Um, but these things are shuttled. So anytime you bring in carbohydrate, that's going to be shipped into tissue as quickly as it can. Uh, creatine then goes along for the ride, and then it brings water for the ride. That's how you enhance hydration. That's why it's important to have carbohydrates when you're trying to hydrate. Um, so you're just going to take it in there, and that's also why you get "quote unquote" cell swelling, uh, which is a good thing. Like you're, it's just enhancing hydration. We actually use it a ton in our post weigh-in protocols. So in individuals that have to cut water weight, uh, creatine is a great thing to throw back in there. It's going to help you rehydrate. It's also why when you take 30 grams of it, it can pull a bunch of fluid in the intestines, and and there you go with your little bit of GI distress. So um, yeah, there's a lot of fun things you can talk about there. Um, I just had to flag that because every time I've been talking about it recently and I say it's cheap, people are killing me for it. So I apologize. I don't know how to make it any cheaper, but it's still fairly, fairly affordable. Yeah, I would say relatively inexpensive compared to a lot of supplements out there. And when thinking about the return on investment is, um, uh, it's quite good. Yeah. And so like actually, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I was just also thinking, um, there's been a number of studies on, uh, sleep deprivation as well with creatine that it can help. So obviously sleep deprivation will generally reduce cognitive function and creatine can ameliorate some of that drop. So if you think about it in that context, I had a crummy night of sleep. Uh, well, and if that enables you to perform a little bit better in your job, then you would make up the dollar or so, whatever you paid for that day's supply of creatine. So um, it is something I kind of on that note, it's not going to work as an acute response. So it's not something you're like, I feel terrible. Let me throw some creatine down the hatch. I'll feel better. That That's not going to work. It's going to take several weeks to have a noticeable effect. It needs to be stored in tissue. Uh, it needs to be built up before you can actually do much of anything. So it is unlike some of the other things like stimulants or caffeine that have an acute you know, response right now. Uh, and so if you're going to take it, you probably need to consume it consistently. If you can't do that, then really there's no point in doing it. Uh, and the loading phase you mentioned, distance we're here, is something you can do, again, if you need to enhance the storage of it really quickly. So say for example, We've done this in some military cases where it's like you get back to base and you've only got a week and then you got to go back out. We may actually have to uh, do a little bit of a loading phase then. Um, but if that's not the case, um, the loading phase is unnecessary. It's not really harmful other than maybe GI stress and maybe waste, but you're going to have three or four weeks. It's going to reach full saturation, plenty of time to, to be there in that if you're in that three to seven grams per day range. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the slow accumulating positive effects of creatine as compared to so-called acute effects because the way that I think of health promoting and performance enhancing protocols like viewing morning sunlight or um, endurance exercise for that matter, or creatine or sleep, for instance, is that while they can have effects in the immediate term, you might feel a little bit, or in the case of a good night's sleep, a lot better. It's really the cumulative effect of raising your baseline level yep. of functioning. You know, there's uh, another way to think about it is um, these, supplements or behaviors um, and quality nutrition when done consistently over time. And that doesn't mean 100% of the time, but yeah. you know, probably 80% of the time. Sure. Lead to a sort of uh, buoyancy in your system that allows you to be more resilient under conditions uh, where conditions aren't perfect, right? And if conditions are made perfect or close to perfect and you already have that buoyancy, that's when you really start to see the ultra high performance effects um, that are so much fun but they have to be established through consistent supplementation, consistent nutritional intake. So today I know we're going to distinguish between 
Uh, normally they're called chronic and acute effects, but that yep. makes it sound like chronic illness. The moment people hear chronic, well, they might think of other things, but but in the context of health, they typically think of you know chronic illness. And we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is slow modulatory effects in the body. A lot of things in the body take time to build up, but once they've built up, they uh, they clearly can benefit us. Um, and then other things, as you mentioned, you know, a, a stimulant, for instance, yep. has a very acute effect that is going to occur with, you know, peak within 30 minutes and wear off within, you know, four hours or so can also have some chronic effects, but typically it's a short lived effect. So we just want to frame up the, the language that we'll be using. And I'm really excited to dive into this topic. And I think creatine is a beautiful example of a supplement that has positive, chronic, mental and physical benefits. Down the road, I can come back and talk a little bit more about creatine and we can cover some other information regarding best practices for getting the most out of it, as well as we'll certainly dive into some of the common side effects or at least a thought of side effects. Um, while we're here, though, I also could throw in a few other of these high impact, low cost, generally safe um, things that are my 80 20 rule, if you will. So the way I actually kind of think about it is uh, you want one from each of three categories. Uh, and these categories are fuel, stimulant, and fatigue blockers. So creatine is actually in the fuel. It's not a stimulant. As we talked about it's a chronic effect there. So we've already knocked that one off. Uh, another one from the uh, fatigue blocker is going to be anything like beta alanine or sodium bicarbonate. And then from the stimulant use, of course, we have anything like a beetroot juice to a caffeine or uh, something of the equivalent. So we can come back again and talk about all those in more detail uh, a little bit later.